everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you as we uh, begin to settle in and arrive for the practice and more people are joining. I'd love if you could just drop in the chat uh, where you're at, where you're calling in from. And uh, tonight we're gonna be talking a lot about transitions. So what energy are you transitioning with into this session? Uh, there's a lot going on in the world. There's a, you know, a lot going on today in your life. What are you seeking to, um, how are you seeking to transition into this session tonight? So setting an intention for how you'd like to arrive and show up and be here together. And as you're doing that, I'll just kind of uh, tick through some of our, our opening uh, welcoming points. So um, as May said, we're here at the virtual San Francisco Dharma Collective, um, a Sangha run organization. And I think, you know, for me, one of the beautiful things about the SFTC is the diversity of the offering. Uh, and as you heard, just in that little um, overview from Mace, the uh, offerings that are here at SFTC are really like none other. It's a space that's been created by the Sangha for the Sangha. Um, and that diversity really allows the Dharma to come to life in a, a broader, more dynamic way. So um, thank you for all of your support of the collective and uh, the teachers. So tonight is the uh, Wednesday night Sangha Well of Being, uh, and this is Eve Ekman and Chandra Lopan's uh, Sangha, um, where uh, it's a contemporary translation of the Buddhist practices. So yes, we'll be talking a lot about um, the writings and the ancient scripture, However, there is a translation and you'll be hearing me talking a lot about my own personal experiences with the Dharma and how it supported me. So um, cultivating this kind of sense of a steady mind and an open heart, that's kind of the premise of the well of being. Uh, so many of you um, I have uh, sat with before, both as a student and as a teacher. Uh, so I, my name is Tig O'Malley. Uh, I am a meditation teacher. I'm trained in both secular and Dharma programs. Uh, I teach in hospitals and universities. Uh, we actually just finished teaching our first queer meditation course uh, with the SFDC, a six week course uh, called Cultivating Emotional Balance. Um, and Mace, I had the privilege of holding that space with me. So, uh, <clears throat> so it is an honor to be with all of you tonight. Um, so in uh, currently in the well of being, there's for many of you that have um, regularly sitting with the Wednesday night Sangha, you're familiar with the Lojong. And the Lojong is a system of mind training. Um, the ancient um, system of these slogans, so these short kind of pithy uh, statements to help us um, consider and contemplate and practice uh, how we can cultivate a steady mind and an open heart. Um, you'll hear me uh, refer to bodhicitta uh, quite often tonight. And uh, for those of you that sit on the Wednesday uh, Sangha, you're familiar with bodhicitta, but for those of you that may be newer, uh, it's this concept of the awakened heart. Uh, there's a whole teaching on this that, you know, we could do hours on the whole, you know, retreat on bodhicitta, uh, but it's basically the awakened heart. Um, and there's two aspects to bodhicitta. There's the ultimate and the relative. And many of the teachings that we have in Dharma centers are really focused on the ultimate, kind of penetrating through the delusion of this uh, samsaric existence that we're in. Um, but also important to say that there's the relative aspect of bodhicitta. As I like to kind of joke sometimes, the relative is the practice while we wait to become enlightened. <laughs> uh, so uh, tonight's talk will be, uh, the slogan for tonight is very highly ultimate bodhicitta. Uh, we are gonna be focusing on death uh, as a moment of transition. 
Uh, so that's kind of the ultimate, but I'd really like to frame tonight more about the relative. So even though the teaching is gonna be about the ultimate level of reality, um, I would like to present a little bit more about how that shows up in our life. Uh, teachings on death are always heavy and we bring our own fears and our own attachments and aversions to this concept. And so uh, as we progress through the night, you'll be hearing me referring to this idea of transitions. So we'll be using um, the ultimate teachings on death to help us in this re relative uh, existence that we're navigating through. And I really like this quote from Eve, um, the Lojong slogans are like a technology. I think that's a really interesting way of, of looking at these slogans, like a key to unlocking a better understanding of the heart and the mind. So tonight we're gonna begin with a preliminary practice that many of you may be familiar with when studying the Lojong. Uh, and then we're going to jump into our slogan for this evening, uh, which is very dense, uh, lots to unpack. And then we'll uh, follow that with a short reflection period, and then we'll uh, end with our dedication. So a couple quick guidelines for this session. Uh, as always, an invitation to be present. So if we were in the physical space together, we would be turning our phones off right now and starting to really anchor ourselves in what's here. And given that we are on uh, Zoom and we are using our technology, the invitation here is to set this intention to be here fully. And texts may come through or there may be a temptation to check social media or uh, email. And so let's set, let's set this intention to be here and be present. Um, also to be open, you know, we are gonna be talking about death tonight and that might be tough. So just being open to what you hear, what arises in your experience. I will be sharing uh, through the course of the evening, my own experiences um, that uh, are, can be traumatic to hear about. Uh, and so again, the invitation is to just be open, see what arises in your own experience and then use that as your practice. And with that, being patient, you know, I think any kind of Dharma teaching on the ultimate transition of death can be tough. And so to just be patient with it, let the medicine do its work uh, and, and take, it, take its time moving through you. Um, and then lastly, taking care of yourself. So as many of you that sat with me before, I like to say this is not meditation boot camp. We're not striving or struggling. We want to cultivate this sense of relaxation and ease. So however that shows up for you, whether it's in your posture or whether it's taking a break or turning your camera off if you need to, um, just really setting this intention to take care of yourself here tonight. And I just want to take a look at what people are writing here. So, uh, Transitioning from anxiety and tension to rest, transitioning into wisdom and calming, dinner to calm. Hmm. Seems like to be a theme emerging here. Uh, and uh, Diana, okay, so yeah, the slogan tonight is number 17. Uh, so we'll be jumping into that after our preliminaries. Um, so thank you all for sharing. Uh, so before we get into our preliminaries, just to talk a little bit about what we're about to practice. So these are um, preliminaries that are specifically for uh, taking teachings on the Lojong. And so I like to think of them as reminders of some of the foundational concepts of the Dharma that these teachings are based in. And uh, as a way of preparing the mind, opening the heart to receive the teachings. Um, I also like to think of them kind of as the foundation for the practice. So we'll enter into this practice with just a short arriving, a few moments of arriving and settling in. And then there'll be uh, four aspects that will be more of like a analytical meditation, less about mindfulness or heart opening, but just 
considerations on these four aspects of the preliminary practices. Um, so that may be different, different for some of you. Um, again, just bringing the open mind to this experience. Um, so let's begin to settle in. So finding a posture that's comfortable for you, uh, whether that's seated on the floor or a chair, you can stand up or lay down. <clears throat> and our first invitation here is just to begin noticing how we're transitioning from movement into stillness. As the body begins to settle in, just noticing what's alive in our experience as we shift from our day and our evening into this session together. Perhaps there's a sense of anticipation, maybe lingering thoughts or an energy carrying forward from the day into this session. And that's perfectly fine. Just welcoming all that's here. And if you feel comfortable closing the eyes, please do so. Or if you'd like to leave them open, perhaps just lowering them down to a surface in front of you. And let's begin to deepen our arrival by just bringing the awareness down through the body and beginning to feel the contact the body making with the ground beneath it, whether that's the chair or the floor or cushion. And just taking a few moments here to feel the support rising up to meet the body, receiving that support without even having to do anything, just being here. Even though the mind may be moving quickly or there's other experiences in the environment around you, anchoring into the ground gives us a practice of stability, an anchor. And then bringing the awareness now up through the body. And as we do that, let's just check the posture that the back is straight, the spine, the neck, and the head are all in one straight line. Perhaps a, even a sense of lifting through the vertebrae of the spine, and cultivating this sense of dignified posture. And then we'll balance that by cultivating a sense of relaxation. So checking that the muscles around the eyes are soft, the jaw is loose. And even though the back is straight, we can allow the shoulders to softly drop down and back. And to help support the sense of relaxation, let's just take three deep diaphragmatic breaths together, inhaling, softening the abdomen and allowing it to expand as you breathe in. And then releasing and relaxing as you breathe out. And two more breaths like that, just breathing in, expanding the abdomen. Breathing out, relaxing and releasing. And one more deep breath in like that. And then at the end of that breath, just returning back to your natural breathing rhythm without manipulating or forcing the breath to be a certain way. And before we move into the main part of this practice, let's set an intention for this practice and for this evening together to be open, to be curious, 
to be present. And with the motivation that this time together can support a greater sense of well being for us and also all those around us, creating a ripple effect through our communities. And from here, we'll begin to move into these preliminary considerations of our practice and our experience. And first we'll come to the preciousness of this human life, this gift that we've been given. And considering that we could have manifested in any number of other beings, animals or other creatures, but we're here as in this human form. And with that comes opportunity and leisure. Leisure to be relaxed, be able to eat without threat, like an animal, to be able to even just relax the body as we come into this meditation. And with this opportunity to practice, there's no other life form that we know of on this planet that can practice like this, that can explore their inner world, introspection and reflection, that can achieve personal growth, understanding, cultivating of compassion. And so let's take a moment here just to simply observe a moment of gratitude for this life, for this precious human life, and the opportunity and leisure that it affords us. and cultivating this sense of appreciation for this life, even through its ups and downs, the hard days, the good days. Just that we're here and we're able to practice. And now moving to our next consideration that all things are impermanent, considering the fluid, ever-changing nature of reality. Everything is constantly moving around us. And our perception that things are solid and independent from each other is really challenged by this consideration of impermanence, knowing that everything is moving, even in what we consider or perceive to be solid, still the molecules inside are vibrating. And through this impermanence, a realization that what is difficult or challenges in life, they will change. And so to the good things, Life is impermanent. At some point, I will die and you will die as well. We don't know when, we don't know how, but we do know that it will happen. And not to be morbid, but to empower ourselves to use this time that we have, use this precious life that we've been given. And so pausing for a moment here, just to cultivate a sense of presence for this moment and rest in all that is arising and passing away, whether it's an awareness of the breath rising and falling, or perhaps sensations in the body. Just taking a moment to rest here, even among all of the movement and impermanence of this present moment. And now moving to our third aspect here, the law of cause and effect, 
otherwise known as karma. And so considering for a few moments that everything we experience has a cause. Nothing happens randomly or independent of something happening before it. And so with this, everything begins with intention. I like to consider intention as karma. It is the cause that we sow our effects from. And so returning to our intention for this evening, for this moment, whether you'd like to stay with openness or presence or setting your own intention, perhaps even setting an intention to be the cause of goodness in the world. Knowing that every intention, every thought, speech, action has an effect. And then finally arriving at our last aspect of this practice, samsara is unsatisfactory. And samsara is this perpetual cycle of attachment and aversion caused by our ignorance of the true nature of reality, our greed and hate. And so considering how easily we react, we grab on to what feels good and we push away what doesn't feel good and how we become caught in this cycle of striving and pushing away, it knocks us out of our center by grabbing, by grasping and clinging, by averting and avoiding. It pulls us out of the present moment. And so taking a moment here just to be with all that is arising without grasping onto what feels pleasant and pushing away what's unpleasant just holding both. And not to feel bad about how we participate in samsara, but just to notice it, just to be here with it. You may like to practice by finding an area of the body or an aspect of this present moment that's feeling pleasant and good, supportive, and widening the awareness to also consider an aspect of your experience that is difficult right now, whether that may be pain in the body, tightness or tension in the body or the mind, the heart and just resting with these seemingly dichotomous experiences, broadening the awareness to hold both at the same time without pushing away what's pleasant, pushing away what's unpleasant and grabbing onto what's pleasant. And so we've just gone through these preliminary practices of the Lo Jung. And I'd like to invite you now, before we come to an end of this part of the practice, just to rest with either the breath or perhaps sounds in your environment or sensations in the body. Just taking a few moments here before we make another transition to be present with the sensations and the senses of this moment. letting go of that analytical meditation and the cognitive activity and just resting the mind and either the breath or another sensory experience just for a few moments.
and noticing how the mind may be moving, becoming distracted by other thoughts, other sensations in the body or your experience. And treating that also as a transition, noticing when the mind has slipped away from the present moment and gently transitioning back to the anchor of your experience. Noticing if you're analyzing or evaluating this practice and allowing that to be here as well. Whenever that may happen, just choosing to return back to the anchor that you've chosen. And as we come to an end of this preliminary practice, releasing whatever you've been focusing your attention on and preparing to make a transition once again back to open eyes if you've had them close and returning to an awareness of each other that are gathered here now. So thank you all for that practice. Um, before we move into our slogan, I just wanted to take a, a moment here to see if there's any questions or experiences that you'd like to share from that practice. And if so, perhaps just dropping a line in the chat. Again, if you have any questions about what we just did or you'd like to share anything that came up for you, um, we just have a few minutes here if you'd like to share that in the chat. Uh, and as we wait to see if anything comes up, also knowing that at any point during the uh, session tonight that you can always ask uh, questions uh, or comments in the chat and we'll keep an eye on them as we go. Okay, so uh, we'll make our transition we Can start picking up on a theme here. <laughs> so tonight we have slogan 17. Uh, so this is a, even the slogan itself is quite long. So I'm just gonna read it for you. The slogan tonight is practicing the five strengths, the condensed heart instructions and the Mahayana instructions on how to die, how to conduct yourself is important. So right off the bat, we got a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of fertile soil to work with tonight. <laughs> uh, so I'd like to invite you to keep a really broad perspective about death. We're gonna we're gonna dive in in a minute. I'm gonna give a little bit of background on some of the. Dharma um, point of view on death before we go into these five strengths to help us practice for that. Um, so the a little bit uh, around some of the background here, I draw a lot of my understanding on the Dharma teachings on death from the Tibetan Book of the Dead, uh, as well as Lama Yeshi's um, Intro to Tantra. These are both very influential um, on me and my understanding of the process of death and why we practice the way that we do now while we're alive for that moment of death. Um, and so both in the Tibetan Book of the Dead and in the Intro to Tantra, 
the process of death of the body is outlined so we can have a better understanding of what happens as consciousness leaves the body. Uh, the uh, opening of the heart chakra so that the non-physical aspect of consciousness can leave the body. Um, the heart chakra being the seat of the mind, the seat of the heart. As many of you have heard in previous teachings on bodhicitta, heart and mind in these traditions are the same. So a lot of the visualizations are include this kind of unnodding of the heart chakra in order to allow this non-physical energy to continue moving. Um, and so I think it's important to talk about what are we, where is it moving to? And so obviously, you know, we're in a Dharma, a Dharma center. So the belief here is that consciousness will move into the bardo, which is the in-between state. We don't have a body anymore, but there's still awareness. Uh, and bardo is where consciousness would wait to take a, a rebirth, to reincarnate. But I'd also like to open this up to a broader point of view, whether your worldview includes uh, an afterlife of heaven or hell, and also calling into mind, you know, even science has showed us that in the first law of thermodynamics, that energy is not created or destroyed. It simply moves from form to form. So uh, I'd like to invite you again to keep an open mind here. You don't need to believe in reincarnation or heaven in order to practice this. Um, we're working really with what happens as the energy, this non-physical energy leaves the body. Uh, and so these instructions are considered to be the ejection of the consciousness uh, at death. And so why do we wanna practice this? Well, I'm gonna you know, cut right to the chase here. So a steady mind and an open heart at the moment of death allows that energy to flow easier, to flow smoother. So if you're more on the Buddhist tip, it's to flow into bardo easier. If you're more on another worldview, it's so you can you know, move into heaven. Uh, if you're more on the science end of it, it's just so there can be an easier transition at the time of death. And I think we'll all agree that it would be amazing to meet that moment with a sense of steadiness and peace. So regardless of what your worldview is here, whether it's religious or more secular, it's still, it all applies here of meeting that moment, that final moment, that final transition uh, from life into death of the body with that steady mind and open heart. And already, you know, we can start labeling these things more specifically in terms of our practice. The steady mind is mindfulness, the foundations of mindfulness. And the open heart, which we'll talk a little bit more about, the four measurables, kindness, compassion, empathetic joy, equanimity, the steadiness that comes from uh, coming into the heart uh, and cultivating that metta and compassion. Uh, I read, uh, many of you may be familiar with this book, Old Path, White Clouds. It's a retelling of the Buddha's life from Thich Nhat Hanh. It's a really beautiful, very thick book. Uh, for me, I, I read it four times, can't put it down. I highly recommend it. Uh, there's a, a beautiful story about the Buddha. He had attained enlightenment already and he was called back to the palace as his father, the king, was on his deathbed. And the Buddha entered the room and uh, people were crying. They were saying, you know, please don't go. Uh, we're nothing. This, we're nothing without you. This kingdom will fall apart without you. Please stay. And they were sobbing and crying. Um, and the Buddha sent them out of the room because that attachment, that clinging to the king's life was actually causing a disturbance in the ability for that energy to move forward into Bardo into heaven into the universe. And I thought that that was a really, that, that story was really influential on me of um, understanding how important it is to meet that moment with that steadiness so it can allow the energy to flow. Uh, there's some of you may be familiar with the practice of POA, 
which is a Tibetan practice of visualizing the moment of death, either for ourselves or for another, a loved one or a pet. Uh, and just visualizing that energy moving effortlessly with ease into the next experience as a way of not attaching, of freeing them. Um, and I think, you know, I also like to say, this is hard. I'm not saying that, you know, at death or at a difficult transition that we shouldn't be sad, we shouldn't cry. It's really just an invitation here to notice what arises and practice now freeing ourselves from our attachments and aversions. So at the moment of death, that energy can continue moving. <clears throat> I also, uh, one of, many of you know that I lived in a Tibetan monastery in Nepal for uh, a year. And one of my teachers there always offered this, which I thought was great. You know, First one was before any of our meal breaks, they would always say, you might not make it to dinner. You know, just as a reminder, like of that impermanence and the preciousness of life. And again, not to be morbid, but to just be, be with this moment and appreciate what's here now, even when it's difficult. And just remembering the fragility and um, the preciousness of life. So sometimes it's a nice little reminder, you know, like, whatever may arise, we might not make it to the end of the session. So let's be here with it. But the other thing that uh, one of my teachers in the monastery said, there's these practices for letting go that we do without even knowing it. Uh, practice for death, practice for letting go. And uh, one is falling asleep. So we have to let go in order to actually fall asleep. Sneezing, we have to let go in order to allow the sneeze to come. And interestingly enough, having an orgasm. These are the three ways that we can practice kind of in our mundane lives of how to let go. And I just thought that that was a really interesting anecdote uh, offering on some aspects of how we can practice letting go. And as I've been saying throughout this entire teaching, it doesn't have to be just about death. So the, the slogan tonight says, how to conduct yourself. Uh, and so like, how to conduct yourself through making a transition and using these five strengths that we're about to uh, cover as a practice for that. I like to think about these practices of dying as an invitation to live more fully. How we can practice dying helps inspire us to live with more presence, with more ease, with that steady mind and open heart. So, we're going to move into these five strengths. And this is what the slogan offers us tonight on how we can practice uh, meeting moments of transition, whether it's death, uh, a new job, uh, administration and the government. You know, we're, we're moving through this time of transition in our nation. And so here's a practice. How do we meet this transition with a steady mind and an open heart? especially when there is controversy and resistance to that transition that arises, uh, at least for me, you know, fear, this uncertainty, this um, uncomfortable feeling. And so the invitation here is to use these five strengths that I'm about to take us through as a practice. Um, so whether tonight you'd like to reflect on death or just making another transition in your life, that's up to you. So these five strengths. Um, the first is strong determination. And so this is also uh, known as the power of resolution. So stating, I will maintain a steady mind and an open heart. This is bodhicitta, strong determination to embody bodhicitta maintaining that wisdom of clear seeing, of emptiness, of egolessness, even in difficult times of uh, transition, whether death or an administration. And I like this uh, quote here, taking a firm decision that for this month, this year, until we die or until we attain enlightenment, we will not abandon bodhicitta, even through hurt or injury, even though hurt or injured by others, we will not give way to anger. So for me, this strong determination is really going back to that idea of setting an intention, 
it's not a, you know, I think a lot of times when we hear about resolution, strong determination, it's like this striving, this um, thing that we require a lot of willpower. But really the invitation here is about cultivating a desire to be this way, um, arising not from effort and grasping, but through touching into our own felt experience um, as a moment of shared humanity, which ultimately is what Bodhicitta invites us to consider. So that's strong determination. And then the second strength is familiarization and this idea that the Dharma comes first nature so that when we do meet the moment of death or a moment of another transition in our life, that we already have a very familiar sense of what a steady mind and an open heart is. So why are we practicing mindfulness? Why are we practicing metta? So we can become familiar with that feeling. So when we meet that moment of transition that we have, you know, from a scientific perspective, we already have the pathways in the brain from a Dharma perspective, that we already have the imprints on our consciousness that support us through that transition. Uh, I have this line here from the Dharma that says, developing a sense of awareness and virtues that you do not panic while you are dying. Uh, one of my own you know, stories that I'd like to share, I was uh, in India crossing a very precarious bridge uh, it was swinging back and forth and it was over the Ganges and in front of me was a moped coming full force beeping at me uh, and behind me was a bull, a cow with horns and no room to move aside from kind of the, the ropes that were holding the bridge forward and, and I totally panicked, you know, and this is after a year in a monastery talking about death, talking about maintaining a steady mind and, you know, ultimately I just leaned my body up against those ropes and let the cow and the moped deal with their stuff. But uh, for me, it was that panic of, oh my gosh, th this is it, I'm gonna die. You know, I, whether or not this person on the moped is intending to it, I'm either gonna get hit by him, I'm gonna get impaled by this bull, or I'm gonna fall off this bridge. And, it was a moment for me of realizing I still have practice to do because I was meeting that moment of potential death in a panic. Uh, I, I, I was attached, I was attaching it, grasping to my life. I didn't want to die. And if it had come to fruition, I would not have been in a very good place because I would be grasping and pushing away rather than cultivating this familiar sense of steady mind, open heart. And I like to think about this familiarization also, those of, the, of you that have sat with me before, you've heard me say all the time, the medicine only works if you take it. So we can only become familiar if we have a consistent and disciplined practice. So not only, you know, I think a lot of times people come to the Dharma, they come to meditation because they want to feel better. And that doesn't happen right away. We have to practice over time. So when we do meet these moments of difficulty of transition, we have these familiar feelings. Um, and I like to think, you know, like you can't think your way out of a difficult moment. You have to be able to feel, you have to already have the pathways in place. So the best way to meet that moment is to practice before it happens. So you can develop that familiarization. The third uh, strength is the seed of virtue. So practicing the four measurables, which I know this Sangha uh, are experts in, uh, the four measurables being loving kindness, the wish for self and others to be happy, compassion, the wish for self and others to be free from suffering, empathetic joy, finding happiness and other people's happiness. And I also like to add gratitude into that. Um, and then equanimity, so not, equanimity, not just as the steadiness and the balance, but also as the equal wish for all beings to be free from suffering, no matter what they have said or done. And so cultivating these seeds of virtue is an accumulation of merit, so that when we do meet that moment, uh, we have those karmic imprints to help us 
move through that, that transition to move through death with these seeds of virtue. The fourth uh, strength is re reproach or also known as revulsion, uh, otherwise known as abandonment of the ego. <laughs> so I'm gonna just talk a little bit about what the Dharma says uh, and then a little bit about my point of view on it. So the traditional teachings as we all know in the Dharma is to be quite critical of the ego, to be resentful of it. In the teachings of the slogan, uh, it's really inviting us to acknowledge the difficulty that the ego creates for us. And I like this, uh, you know, many of you may be familiar with the Buddha at um, the time of his enlightenment. He said, jailkeeper, oh jailkeeper, I'm now free from your shackles. And he was speaking to his ego. And so I think it's this, you know, in, in the Dharma teachings, there is this kind of pushing away this demonization of the ego and my personal belief here just to share this is you know the the to honor the ego to welcome it to know that it's trying to keep us alive uh, that we can acknowledge that the ego is an evolutionary tool that has actually served us quite well in terms of our survival does it always serve us well perhaps not uh, and that's why we practice this steady mind, this open heart. Um, the issue is when we start identifying as the ego rather than the awareness of it. So uh, as I also like to say, you know, the ego can be in the car, it just doesn't need to be driving. And so I think again, this, this strength that we're being invited in this slogan to consider of how we relate to our ego so maybe the traditional teaching might be to push it away and to overcome it. And I'm just offering that maybe we can see it as something that can, we can work with and that can support us uh, as long as we don't identify with it. And then uh, the last strength is aspiration. So again, being clear on our intention and you know, at, at the end of all of our practices, uh, our Dharma practices, we're always dedicating the energy to a cause, to a person. Uh, so um, there's this quote here, whatever conflicts I may encounter, may I be able to use them as steps along the path. I think that's a really powerful aspiration. So those are the five strengths, um, very heady, very cognitive based. I'm just checking in on time. Um, great. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for some questions, but before we do that, I wanted to share a little bit about, a little bit more about my personal experience with this. And um, I mentioned that there was that time on the bridge and that, that really was an experience for me. It was like a check-in on where my mindfulness practice was in meeting that moment of threat to my life and seeing that I still had some work to do there. And so that's one half of, you know, we have, we have all of these, um, these cognitive explanations of these five strengths. And I like to just keep it simple, steady mind, open heart. So that experience on the bridge for me was touching into where that panic, where, where I, it opened the door for me to see that I need to practice a little bit more. Um, but I'd also like to share uh, another uh, experience that I've had. Um, and before I do, I'd like to just preface this by saying, um, this may be difficult to hear. Uh, it is traumatic, um, but I do believe that there are a lot of fruits in this experience that I would like to share with you. Um, and so actually one year ago tonight, um, I was assaulted in San Francisco, um, by a man yelling homophobic slurs. And the way that the, the way that it unfolded is that we had uh, an encounter where he began verbally assaulting me. And I was able to get away from him. Um, there was a very interesting dynamic that happened in my mind stream as I was walking away from him where it felt familiar because I too was subject to the same conditioning that this man was 
in our society, the demonization of the feminine, especially for a male man to be carrying it. Um, the wherever the message comes from in the world that being gay is wrong. I also internalized that and had to work for many years in therapy on overcoming that. And I'm sharing this with you because I realized it was a sense of commonality between me and this man. I understood his suffering. And so as I walked away, I saw him go in a different direction. It was this understanding that led me instantly to a sense of compassion. You know, I know what it's like to suffer. I know what it's like to receive a message that this is wrong or that this is bad. And I know what it's like. And so I immediately, without thinking about it, went into my meta practice. May you be free from that suffering to this man, you know? Um, may all people that have experienced this, this kind of discrimination and, and hate be free from that. Um, and so for about 10, 15 minutes, I was walking um, to meet my friends for dinner and, you know, just considering what had happened and practicing metta as I walked. And it was actually quite beautiful. You know, I was, I was immediately with that, again, that familiarization, it just came second nature. As soon as I had that understanding of this man's suffering, the next moment was compassion. And then out of nowhere, he came out of the shadows and attacked me. And please hear this with an open mind. I looked into his eyes and I did not feel any sense of separation from him. That practice of 15 minutes of understanding that shared humanity between him and I and practicing opening my heart to him allowed me to meet the moment where he began to physically assault me with this sense of calm, this sense of understanding what was happening. Um, I'm gonna take a moment here and just pause and uh, take a breath. And I think, you know, the experience that unfolded from there, you know, there, there obviously it was, it was very difficult. Um, I'm sure some questions are coming up from you about what happened. And um, I ended up in the hospital and had staples in the back of my head and concussion and it was difficult. However, the entire experience through the ambulance in the emergency room, I don't think that I would have been able to navigate it without that sense of open heart without that practice of years of cultivating metta and compassion and understanding that it is the common humanity that allowed me to then experience the trauma in with a perspective of this steady mind and open heart. And I'm not saying that I handled it perfectly um, or that I wasn't angry or that the past year has not been difficult but without these five strengths, you know, without really understanding the process of what happens at that moment of death and, and knowing, you know, as I say to, to people when I tell the story, as he was hitting me, I couldn't say, could you please stop? I need to think about how the Dharma wants me to respond to this. It was second nature. It came right away. Um, I understood. I understood his fear. I understood his anger. And so in a way, it became this kind of emotional boundary that didn't let it, it didn't, it allowed me to stay steady and calm and keep the open heart all the way through. even in the processing of it over the past year of understanding, you know, this man is suffering and my own practice of forgiveness, all of these five strengths, the determination to maintain bodhicitta, maintain my vows of bodhisattva, even in that moment of threat to my life, 
the familiarization that I spoke about of knowing this felt experience came without me having to think about it. It wasn't cognitive. It came from feeling, from the seeds of virtue, from a daily heart opening practice, from you know, some of you that have sat with me before that we've done the, these applied practices of metta on social media, you know, scrolling through our email, scrolling through social media, offering these wishes of kindness and compassion to all of those that we're seeing, walking down the street as people walk by us, may you be free from suffering. These seeds of virtue became so familiar to my consciousness that it was the reaction that supported me through it. You know, as I, I mentioned, the, the um, revulsion of ego, that sense of separation between us uh, wasn't, wasn't there. And this aspiration of whatever conflict I encounter, uh, may I see it as steps on the path. I think last week the slogan was, may we meet any all uh, things that are unexpected as a meditation. And so this entire experience for me has become that. So I didn't die, I'm here. And I have this, you know, this message, this, I'd like to use this example um, as a transition. It, didn't, it wasn't about death in that moment. It was this practice for living. And that's what this past year has become. What these five strengths, what the Dharma, what my, the support of my friends and family have allowed me to make that transition, you know, it's weird today, feels almost like my birthday uh, because, well, I don't need to explain that. I think I see some nodding heads there. <laughs> um, it was almost like a rebirth in itself. And so while I didn't die and while this slogan is about death, I really wanted to share this with you, not just as the examples of the five strengths, but that we can make these transitions um, whether it's death, whether it's a threat to our life, whether it's a difficult and uncertain transition of the administration, whether it's a new job, whether it's a, whatever it may be happening in our lives that is asking us to meet that moment with a certain quality, it's this steady mind, the clear seeing and wisdom of mindfulness and the virtue of the heart that can carry us through. So before we move into our uh, own reflection period on this, I'd like to open it up. I know that um, this is a very heavy slogan and I also am acknowledging that I shared a very heavy um, experience. And so um, if there's anything that's arising, any questions, um, let's, I can open it up now. Uh, if you'd like to, um, you can just uh, either ask, unmute yourself and ask, or if you feel better writing it in the chat. But um, just taking a moment to consider these five strengths of determination, familiarization, seeds of virtue, repulsion of ego, and aspiration. And also anything that comes up from you hearing this teaching. Thank you, Katie. Tig, I have a question if nobody else does. Oh, but there's one in the chat box. Why don't you attend to that and then I'll ask. Sure, so uh, Ryan is asking, describe the practice you were doing that helped prepare you to be so peaceful during the assault. I, it's the four immeasurables, you know, every morning I choose a different four immeasurable. Um, 
and work with it. You know, I, those of you that have sat with me um, know that, you know, I, I really have uh, offer an invitation that the metta practice moves at a certain point, moves beyond just these wishes for um, health and, uh, and peace and becomes more customized. So like, what is it that's going well in my life? What am I grateful for right now? This feeling of connection with you all. May all beings feel connection. And it becomes less about the words and more about the feeling. Thinking about what's difficult in your life right now, uncertainty. May all beings be free from uncertainty. And again, it becomes less about the actual cognition and more about the felt experience. I think that the traditional slogan, uh, the traditional phrases of, you know, may you be happy, may you be healthy, may you be safe are very important. And those are like the ground that we can practice on, but make it your own. Practice with what's alive for you so you can actually feel it and then take it into the world. You know, I always say that the formal practices on the cushion are so important, um, at, but they don't mean anything if we don't take them out into the world. So someone cuts us off in traffic, may you get to where you're going on time and safely. You know, like make it, make it real. And I think the other thing that really helped me in that moment, especially with, with this man was this understanding, this, this shared experience of being human. And it's hard to talk about in terms of like, you know, language is very limiting here because it was like a non, it wasn't a cognitive experience. I wasn't like thinking, how should I respond to this? But I saw the fear and the anger in his eyes and I understood him because I too have fear and anger. And so I think the other practice would be allowing these difficult emotions to be here, to not push them away to be able to sit with what is difficult about this precious human life so that when someone else is causing us or perceived to be causing us difficulty, we can understand where they're coming from. It doesn't mean that we excuse it. It doesn't mean that we you know, don't have boundaries, um, but that this common experience of this universal experience of wanting to be free from suffering and move closer to what feels good, I think really helped me in my relationship with this man. And because this is a Dharma setting, setting, I can also say, you know, I know that this man and I have been doing this karmic dance for lifetimes and we will continue to do so. So I think that that would be another, um, this broadening, this ultimate nature of reality rather than this relative him, me, uh, kind of thing really also helped me understand what was happening. Um, I'm going to add something here. Uh, you know. <laughs> when I was in the emergency room and the doctors were insistent on giving me morphine. And I don't know if I was, you know, if you would consider myself to be delusional at this state or what it was, but I refused it. And the words that came out of my mouth, I won't be able to practice if you give me morphine and I need to be able to practice with this because what's the point of suffering if I don't learn this lesson? So I think, again, that was just another aspect, again, of this strong determination, you know, that I'm going to be here with this suffering and I'm going to practice with it. So Mace, maybe we can. Yeah, hear. so my question is, um... I, first of all, thank you so much for sharing this really intimate and intense experience and um, for being with us on your one year anniversary. Yeah. So yeah, first that. And then I, I think I just misunderstand the teachings about death. Mm -hmm. I think I, I think 
the teachings are telling me I'm not supposed to want to die. Sorry, I'm not supposed to not want to die. That's a double negative. Like, I, and so you get what I'm saying? Like, but I don't think I want to die. I right. don't want to die. I sure. don't want to die right now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so I get all like caught up, like I'm, I must not be practicing right. And then, you know, like in your story, certainly the bridge story is like really scary, right? Like, and I actually think, you know, when you say, oh, you took that as like, oh, I haven't practiced enough. I think you were actually just having a biological response. And, um, but in the other story, did you even, did you think like, oh, I could die? Like, like, I guess what I'm asking, like, is it really a problem to not be like, oh, I'm like embracing death? Yeah, great question. Thank you for that. I think it's the attachment to it, you know, that um, not wanting to die, of course, you know, we don't want to die. But then it's the attachment that then creates the barrier from for the consciousness to move fluidly. We cannot want to die and still meet the moment of death with peace. And the practice that I would offer and, you know, I always love to say this is like we, we practice in, in, in the Dharma, we practice in meditation with the small things so that when we can meet the big things, we have that familiar path. So my invitation for you and for all of us here is what happens when the mind wanders in our practice? We're focusing on the breath or a body scan and the mind wanders away. What happens? Are we, do we tense up? Do we get mad at ourselves? Do we judge ourselves? Do we cling on to, or, or, you know, that shouldn't happen that way? Can we practice meeting the wandering mind with a sense of equanimity, balance? That's creating the familiar path. So when we meet moments of difficult transition, including death, we have a familiar pattern already of how to meet something like that's happened. We don't want the mind to wander in our practice but it does. And so how we meet that is the practice for, let's just say transition, <laughs> transitions that we might not want to make. And I, you know, I really, again, I, you know, I, I talk about this often, these attitudes of mindfulness from John Kabat-Zinn are hugely influential on my practice, both with mind wandering, but then meeting life. Uh, meeting life, you know, aware of my judgments without striving, trusting, um, accepting and letting go, you know, all of those attitudes of how we meet the wandering mind. It's not just for the sake of the practice on the cushion. It's so that we can meet life and death with those same attitudes. And so I really want to, you know, reemphasize here that it, it may seem like a big stretch to go from awareness of breath to how to die. <laughs> but just like, you know, you, you, most of you have heard me say this example before about like when we need to lift something heavy in our house, when we need to move some furniture. It's the work that we do in the gym to strengthen our muscles that allows us to move that. So we can't just never train and think that we can lift something heavy. And it's the same thing with death, you know, like if we're not practicing in these little ways in our mindfulness practice, in our heart opening practice, to think that we're going to be able to meet death with steady mind and open heart, just because that's what the Dharma says. We have to be practicing. We have to get into that, that, that mind gym, the heart gym. Is that uh, helpful, Amaze? Um, and then Marissa is asking, when you're experiencing anger, were you able to keep your practice of metta central or place it on a shelf to experience the emotion? Do you mean in that moment uh, of the assault or just anger in general? You had talked about in the assault, during the assault, but I mean, in general, it's like, I, I think the assault is uh, a focused example of, a larger uh, experience that can happen over and over again. 
Um, so I'm just asking you, you spoke about not excluding emotions like anger for, as one example in the experience that you can still have those just as you can still set boundaries. So I'm wondering in the emotional side, when you were experiencing the emotions, do you feel like you were able to uh, experience those two things simultaneously or is it, is it like, the wandering mind, come back. The wandering mind, come back. Anger, come back to meta. Anger, come back to meta. Yeah, thank you, Marissa. I think great, you know, really insightful questions. And I think the answer might actually be in there, you know, of being able to hold both, you know, and that's the practice. Like we said in the preliminary practice, can we find something pleasant in the body and something unpleasant and then hold both of those at the same time? That, allow, that is creating the familiar pathway so that we can experience difficult emotions while still being anchored with an awareness of something that is balancing it in that moment. I will say in that moment, um, that fateful night, I didn't experience anger because I practiced before, because I saw his anger and I had already dealt with my you know, years in therapy, years of metta practice, years of cultivating emotional balance. And I'm not saying that I have yet, and I still have a lot of work to do. Um, but in that moment, I don't consider myself to be, I don't, I was living, I wasn't practicing in that moment. I was just there with it. You know, there was a, there was a understanding almost that Every practice that I had done, a year living in a monastery, all of my teachings and practices and trainings with the Dharma, that was the practice that led me to meet that moment with the open heart. And it was life, you know, it was life. So I think what I would say to that also about the difficult emotion is practicing, not pushing away, practicing being with the difficult emotions because in this example of the assault it was the common experience it was the shared humanity that i had with this man that allowed me to understand that brought me to the doorway of compassion and understanding i will also say just to you know put this out there i did experience anger you know at some point about the world that we live in i you know things got a little bit knotted up for me of like politics and <laughs> and Trump and you know like this this sentiment that people that that vote for that party um, it's an act of violence against people LGBTQI you know and so I, I felt a lot of anger that was like really fueled there and so then there's my practice that that has been my practice through this entire election of just being with that anger and working with it and. And even though I don't have a shared felt experience of discriminating others, I do understand what it's like to be confused uh, and to be angry. And so that was my practice. Um, yeah, so no, I'm thinking of death as a transition helpful. And that's, you know, I, again, just to acknowledge this is a heavy teaching, these are heavy examples, but uh, just using it transition, transition. And, and again, practicing with the small things. How do we transition from when we get up from this practice? How do we transition from walking from one room into the next, you know, like maybe stop and pause. Like what's the energy that I'm carrying into this meeting with me? What is, um, what is my intention as I walk through this doorway? Like those are all the little transitions. That, these are all the little moments that we can practice making transitions with that steady mind and open heart. Um, recommended particular Cabot's in book. So chapter two of Full Catastrophe Living, John Cabot's in, is all about the attitudes of mindfulness. Um, and there's also a YouTube video where John speaks to um, the attitudes as well. So chapter two of Full Catastrophe Living and then just Google on you or look up on YouTube. Uh, I think it's called the nine attitudes of mindfulness practice. You're welcome. 
Okay, so um, thank you all for receiving that and uh, both the teaching and the story um, and your questions. Uh, I'd like to uh, end our session just with a short reflection on how we can bring this to life in, in our own experience. So you can just stay as you are. If you'd like to close your eyes just to help deepen the experience and come inwards once again. This has been uh, intense, deep teaching. So just taking a moment to be with whatever is arising and allowing it to be here. And as we've been talking about these transitions, meeting transitions with an open mind, an open heart, a steady mind. I'd like to invite you now to think of a transition that's happening in your own life right now. It could be starting a new job, moving to a new house. It could be the transition of the government. Just calling to mind an aspect of your life that seems to be in transition right now that you'd like to work with. And I'd like to invite you to now visualize yourself making this transition with a steady mind. What does that look like, meeting this transition with mindful awareness, moment-to-moment -moment awareness? And whether you visualize this in your imagination, seeing yourself actually making this transition with steadiness of mind, or maybe it's thought forms that arise, just taking a few moments here to visualize making this transition with a steady mind. And beginning to familiarize ourselves with what it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like to meet this transition with steadiness of mind. And noticing if doubts or skepticism arise and welcoming that but knowing that right now this practice is focusing on what it would be like to make this transition with a steady mind. Creating those pathways in the brain to meet this transition, the moment to moment awareness. And now let's add the the heart into this. So now visualize yourself making this transition with an open heart. Navigating this transition with metta, with karuna, compassion. What does that look like, sound like, feel like? Perhaps it's meeting difficulties along the way of this transition with that sense of open-heartedness, compassion for yourself, compassion for another that might be making the transition difficult. And with this open heart, how can this transition be for the benefit of all? So again, whether you're visualizing that or just using thought forms to consider this altruistic aspect of this transition. And taking a moment now to consider what intentions that you would like to set, what strong determination and aspiration would you like to cultivate for this transition? 
And whether that's words or feeling, just taking a few moments here to set your intentions for how you would like to navigate this transition in your life. And taking a moment to feel into what it would be like to navigate this transition with those intentions as if they have already happened. How would that feel? Is there a sensation in the body that arises, a feeling that's accompanied by this imagining, navigating this transition with these intentions? And now the final consideration here, what is the gift that you would love to offer the world through making this transition? How can you be in service to others and make an offering through your experience of this transition? What goodness can you bring into the world through this transition. And then for a moment now, releasing any visualization or thought forms and just resting in an open awareness What's here? How are you feeling? What's alive for you? And I'd like to end this reflection with this, these words from Pema Chodron on where to begin and how to set intentions for this journey of transition to engage relationships with curiosity, with compassion, to observe surroundings with curiosity, with appreciation, to notice synchronicities with curiosity, with gratitude, to recognize patterns with curiosity, with acceptance, to expand horizons with curiosity, with imagination, to welcome vulnerability with curiosity and with relaxation, to celebrate the many paths with curiosity and with tolerance. The perfect place waits within you need only to begin. Crack open your curious heart. And so we'll end our practice, we'll end our session tonight by considering the energy that we've been cultivating through these teachings on how to conduct oneself at the moment of death and transition, the preliminary practices considering preciousness of human life, impermanence, cause and effect, and the suffering of samsara. And dedicating these merits that we have been cultivating through this session tonight to our highest aspiration of the enlightened mind not just for the benefit of ourselves, but for all beings. May we and all beings be well, be at peace, and be free from suffering.
And if it feels comfortable for you, gently bowing the head as a sign of respect, not just for each other, but also for yourself. And thank you all for showing up tonight to practice, for your presence, for cultivating a steady mind and an open heart. And taking your time once again, if you've had your eyes closed, to return back to open eyes and awareness of light as we begin to make another transition into what comes next after this session. Thank you, my friends. Uh, I will be back teaching Wednesday night with Eve and I will be co-teaching the night before Thanksgiving. So I believe that's the 25th. Um, and then keep an eye out for some other offerings uh, that I'll be making.